a little bit late. We're, we have one board member um, that is straggling a little bit, but he is almost here, so we're going to go ahead and call to order this, this meeting of the Fayetteville Board of Education for the purpose of revisiting the, the um, data, getting some updates on the demographics and whatnot um, to help us make a plan for our middle school zones. Yes, right. ma'am. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Duncan. Thank you. We're very happy to be here, and thanks, everybody, for braving the weather to, to join us so that we can have this very important discussion that will impact potentially a, a lot of students. Um, I am going to ask, we have two people that will be joining us. One is Micah Brassfield from Transpar, and we also have Bob Templeton from Zonda Education, who is our demography team. If we can, please hold questions until the end. They're both joining us via Zoom, and I want to make sure that we've gone through the content that we've prepared for you, but also that they have an opportunity to hear the questions that you may have, and then they can respond uh, toward the end. So if you do have a question, just make yourself a little parking lot, make yourself a little note, and we will circle back to answer all of those questions. So we're going to start. The person that we thought could t represent and tell you the story best of uh, the roundtable discussions, conversations with middle school leaders and with teachers uh, would be none other than Ms. Hayward. And so we're going to start out with Ms. Hayward to give you some information about what the life has been like uh, for McNair Middle School with the current constraints we have on population and size. Dr. Duncan, thank you, board, for allowing me to talk about something that I love. You know, I love middle school. And so um, I, I am grateful that we, we as a team were able to visit with our principals throughout the district as well as teachers. Dr. Colbert and Cabinet came over and visited with McNair and we got some really good information. So when we when we um, spoke to them, there were certain things that we just, we wanted to hear. So uh, understanding our current constraints, what that would look like for teaching and learning, for students, for staff, and then just really determining the best outcomes for our students. So some of the things that, that as you are making this decision, some things that you w might want to consider. Um, as we know very well, there is overcrowding in one of our schools. Um, it uh, inhibits some of those rich middle school experiences that we want to provide for all of our students and that our community expects throughout the years we've had these uh, wonderful things that have been able to be accomplished in the middle level and we want to continue to do that as well as the schools we want to do what's best for students and and that is to have a school that operates within the capacity uh, middle school students middle schools are made for small learning communities so sometimes that becomes a challenge when you have more students um, those small learning communities within a bigger school is sometimes difficult to, to accomplish. And then if you've been in the school, uh, some of these parents have been in the school, um, it, it, it is very difficult sometimes to walk around and just on the daily basis, uh, trying to work through the transitions from class to class, um, teachers looking for extra space to offer those interdisciplinary units um, that's a struggle. And then also, you know, some safety concerns sometimes in the hallways, at cafeteria, and at recess. Speaking of the cafeteria, I know a lot of times we like to go and visit and uh, parents like to attend and go to lunch with their students. That is, that's difficult to do at McNair currently because there's just enough space for the kids. And so we would, we would love to have that opportunity, but that's not an option at this time. Um, crowd control as it relates to extracurricular activities such as dances, assemblies, those can be challenging. Um, and when the numbers exceed capacity, students sometimes struggle to participate in certain clubs, intramurals, uh, plays after school because there are only certain number of parts and certain number of spots. So that's something that we should consider um, for our kids. Encore teachers. So our Encore teachers are maxed out at McNair and have been for several years. 
So they, uh, they're they compensated to do this, but they do teach um, during their planning time. So they agree to do that, and um, and we compensate them. But that, that can be a struggle as well. Traffic continues to be a challenge um, as the population rises at McNair, and there have been concerns about there's been parents that have pulled over on the side of the road in, on mission to let their kids out so that they're not late and parents don't want to really stay in that line for very long. That's, you know, that's a safety issue and we definitely don't want that. So those are just some of the concerns that were brought up by the staff and by some of our principals that we wanted to make sure that you knew. Um, that's all I have, Dr. Colbert. All right, next up is Steve Wickinger. It's not that advanced, it's Mr. Flickinger. It's not a touch screen. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, building capacity. And um, when we're looking at building capacity, we looked at the new John L. Colbert Middle School, Holt Middle School, and McNair Middle School. And um, what we've done to, to determine the capacity of each school is we took the program of requirements from the facilities division, which is a compla, is a, um, is, um, is a square footage of the building that pertains to instructional and support spaces. And that determines the student capacity of each school. And you can see with uh, the new John L. Colbert Middle School, is it's 99,998 square feet. But when you look at Holt and McNair Middle School, they're a little bit bigger at 103,000 square feet. Um, the difference between the, the student capacity of the new school and Holt and McNair Middle School is basically a little over 100 students. And the reason behind that is uh, the new middle school is designed uh, a little more efficiently Although Holt Middle School, McNair Middle School are both very nice facilities, there are some spaces within those schools that are smaller that cannot be used for a general classroom, which for this age group of kids is 28 kids for the max size of the classroom um, with that. So then um, as we go down to Dow Creek, uh, elementary school, when we switch from an elementary to a middle school, we do gain 524 students to the elementary school on that switch. And that's based on if we serve fourth grade students, which has a capacity ratio of 1 to 28, versus if it's a lower group, um, it wouldn't be as many students. But we just need to remember that with this change, we also are netting additional space for elementary students, which is also to our benefit. One of variants that we need to talk about in terms of a space example is that the POR, which dic dictates what the square footage is and then how many students can populate a space, it's based on a classroom being used in a traditional classroom way. And one of the things that we do very well in Fayetteville is we see what our children need. And we start from that place to then determine how the space is going to be used. So one example of that, and there's many that I could give you, but this example is if we have a classroom that's 850 square feet that traditionally would house 28 students with a teacher, with a desk, with a task chair, with a paraprofessional in that classroom. We also have students who have varying needs and have different things that they may need that are written into their individual education plan. And in that place, if they have something written there that requires one of the therapy pieces that we can offer is the ability for students to be on a swing for some type of therapy. And so when you think of a swing, you can think of this not necessarily an outdoor swing like we ha used to have on playgrounds and recesses, but this is more of a therapy swing requiring a nine foot radius and obviously no one standing within the radial area of the swing be being able to be extended and then having the full movement of the room. So in that case, that's an example of one person on a swing and then a paraprofessional and potentially a teacher. So three people would be in that space. So when you're looking at these space examples, I think that was a point of confusion last time when we had this conversation, like, wait a minute, you're using it like this, but the number is that. 
when we make those changes and we use it based on what the child needs versus what the POR reads on a piece of paper, those are some of those variance changes. So our first recommendation for you to consider is to look at rezoning Southeast Fayetteville to zone Southeast Fayetteville neighborhoods to John L. Colbert Middle School to also allow us to flip the start times of schools, meaning that elementary would be starting at 745 and that middle school would be starting at eight o'clock. The reason that we would like this time to be flipped is to allow some additional travel time between Southeast Fayetteville and where John L. Colbert Middle School is located. The pros that we feel like we get from this particular uh, plan are it does allow us to disperse students between middle schools. One of our biggest reasons for recommending this is we are concerned about the overcrowding at McNair. We are also concerned about the traffic issues that we've all heard about happening at McNair. And we also wanna ensure that we have equitable access to our programs and our services across our district for all of our students. We wanna provide a true middle school experience for students. And the impact of this would be approximately 113 students. The cons of this are obviously travel times for students and additional bus routes potentially. Bob Templeton with, um, with Zonda Education is gonna join us. And so Bob, are you on? Yes, good afternoon. Wonderful, good afternoon. I'm glad that you can hear us. I'm gonna to move to your first slide. He's gonna share with you just a recap very quickly of the demography information that you've heard before, and then also talk about what encompasses when we say Southeast Fayetteville, what is Southeast Fayetteville? Thanks, Bob. Sure. Well, first I'll touch on the economic conditions and the economic conditions are very mixed. So. On one hand, we're seeing low unemployment rates. We're also seeing job growth and we're seeing some wage growth. But on the other hand, we're seeing 40 year high inflation. We're also seeing a significant increase in the cost of housing. And while the local unemployment rate is very low, it is definitely a challenging time for families, especially when they're making decisions around purchasing homes. The interest rates, just to give you a comparison, if you'll go to the next slide. I'll well, I'll touch on the overall demographic numbers. The overall population is continuing to grow in Fayetteville. So within the boundary of the school district, the estimated population is a total population of about 100,098 persons, which is up about 27% from the 2010 census. We're seeing very good growth in the total number of households. It's gone up almost 25%. The below age 19 population, which is that population that generally captures the school age population, also up about 25%. And the average household size has stayed pretty consistent at about that 2.4, 2.5 persons range. Next slide. Total housing, this is total home sales. That's both existing home sales and new home sales. You can see we've seen a little bit of a softening in the total home sales over the last couple of years. We do expect 2023 also going to be below total 2000 home sales within the year, just due to the rising interest rates. The rising interest rates are acting as a damper for home sales. And that interest rate has gone from about 3% in the spring and now that interest rate is around 7%. That's causing the monthly payment to go up about $800 a month. Now, here's the overall picture for the district. This is a map that we use every year. It's the elementary attendance zones, and those green shaded areas are the active subdivisions that are building single-family homes. And you'll notice we still have consistent growth across the district. We've got about 44 actively building subdivisions. We are still seeing some future development. So the developers have not stopped just because the interest rates have gone up. But we do expect that 23 is going to be a little bit of a softer season in terms of single family home sales. We've got about 280 homes under construction. So we have seen an increase in the amount of homes under construction simply because Many of those builders couldn't get those homes finished due to supply chain issues. We still have some problems with some of the elements of single family construction. Also, the labor shortages have continued to plague the construction industry. 
And over the summer, we saw an increase in cancellations. So the national cancellation rate is actually about 25%. So the builders are going to be working to get rid of that inventory over the next several months. They're starting to offer some incentives. We're also seeing some softening in some of the pricing. So that could be a, a benefit to some of those buyers. Now, on the multifamily side, this map is showing a zoomed in of the elementary attendance zones again. Those blue shaded areas are the current multi uh, apartment communities. The turquoise shaded areas are the future multifamily units that are in the planning stages. The purple little areas are the multifamily units that are under construction. So we've got about 12,500 multifamily units that are existing, and we do see a pretty significant increase in the construction of multifamily. Now, here's the big picture enrollment projections by grade level. You'll notice this year's enrollment came in at about 113 growth from last year. I expect that number is going to continue to grow a little bit during the year as we get more of those homes occupied from that number that's under construction. This did come a little bit under what we forecasted. We forecasted about 260 students of growth. So you can see it's about 1.9% short of the projections. I have, you know, dialed back the projections from what we saw last spring. The challenging issue is the region is still experiencing job growth. So the area is still attracting families. It's just going to be when does the interest rate start to soften? When do we see some easing in the high inflation rates? And we do expect overall that your enrollment is going to continue to grow. Now, here's a look at the enrollment projections at the elementary campus level. And you'll notice that we do still have some growth pockets that are impacting the enrollments at the elementaries. Holcomb Elementary likely going to be uh, approaching capacity in 2025. And then in 2026, possibly Leverett. I would kind of caution that number at Leverett because some of that has to do with larger class sizes and those younger grade levels. And then Owl Creek starts to approach capacity in 2030. And then Happy Hollow is approaching capacity in 2027, 2028. Next, we'll look at those projections at the secondary campus level. Again, you'll notice we have adjusted the capacities to reflect the most recent capacity analysis. You'll notice that McNair is at capacity right now, and it will be over capacity next year, and it continues to go beyond capacity. We've got a little bit of space at Holt and John L. Colbert Middle Schools. You'll notice at the junior high level, we're in pretty good shape till we get out to about 2031, where Ramey Junior High could be approaching capacity in about eight to nine years. Also pretty good shape at the high school level, likely approaching capacity at the high school level in about 2031. The key takeaways, the housing market is facing headwinds with the rising interest rates. Within Fayetteville Public School District, we've got 280 homes that are under construction. Again, this is a high number. Part of it is the supply chain. Part of it is some cancellations. But we are seeing those builders are going to be working to move that inventory we're actually seeing some builders are starting to turn this inventory into single family for rent. We still have about 1,200 lots available for builders to build on, and there's more than 4,300 future lots in the planning stage. We do expect your enrollment to get just over 11,600 students in five years, and in 10 years, that enrollment could be at about 13,100 students. Now, here's the uh, draft of the plan that uh, was mentioned earlier. This is taking that southeast quadrant of the district. It's primarily the Happy Hollow attendant zone. So that area outlined in red is the area that is proposed to shift from McNair to John L. Colbert. And it represents about 113 intermediate middle school students. With that move, you'll notice that it does drop McNair below its capacity limit. It would likely keep them below the capacity limit through this 10-year model. You'll notice that uh, John L. Colbert 
would approach its capacity in that you know year nine, year ten. So it does provide some time being under capacity for about a at least seven to ten year period. Holt Middle School would be just over 500 students and likely approach 600 students toward the end of this 10 year forecast. Thank you, Bob. Uh, the other person that we have on the call is Micah Brassfield. She's with Transfar and she is going to be talking with us about transportation options. Uh, this, as you know, we are in the process of students coming back on board from COVID, meaning to a full time experience. Some of those students are also being allowed to ride the bus, which they've not uh, ridden in prior years. And we are also merging our data onto a new transportation software and we're adding transportant to our suite of offerings that we have in transportation. So she was given a very tough challenge in a very short amount of time. We look forward to being able to work with her as we work through the additional phases of zoning. But I just wanted to introduce her. Micah, can you hear us? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Duncan mentioned, my name is Micah Brassfield. I'm the Director of Advisory Services for Transpar, and it's our privilege to be with you here today uh, to start our work with Fayetteville Public Schools. Transpar has been engaged in similar work for over 27 years, so we're, we're happy to be a part of this process. On this first slide, it's really to provide context around the scenario that Bob just mentioned with regards to moving the 113 McNair Middle School students to Colbert Middle School. And the most important things from this slide are to really provide context around uh, where students currently reside in proximity to McNair versus Colbert. Um, as you can see, this the, currently the uh, closest students reside anywhere from three miles uh, to McNair up to seven miles, whereas if we're talking about those same students going to Colbert, you will see an, an increase in distance and time that it would take. And this, again, is if we're talking about you and your personal vehicle traveling, picking up one student, how long would it take you from some of these residences to get from McNair versus Colbert? We're not talking about school buses who have to make multiple stops, travel at lower speeds. Um, and so this, this is important to understand just the context of this area and, and where students currently reside in proximity to each of the campuses. Next slide, please. Currently, there are four routes that serve McNair and Happy Hollow students, and those are combined with those students riding together. Um, those four routes average in length approximately 50 to 55 minutes in the morning and afternoon, with some exceptions. Um, you'll notice that the route JJ uh, travels to the furthest east portion of this area, and so it does exceed 60 minutes in length up to an hour and 13 minutes in the morning. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference in the afternoon because that route first picks up one group uh, and then doubles back to pick up another group. So your current ride times are already for most students in this area uh, anywhere between 45 to 55 minutes in length on average. And that's not traveling to a further distance, as we just mentioned, uh, to Colbert Middle School. So we, we want to provide that context on what the current ride times are for students. Next slide, please. So just at a high level, what we would estimate the impact to be for moving students from the McNair area to, or currently attending McNair to Colbert uh, is that this would require an earlier pickup time for students on in the morning and afternoon, an earlier drop off um, at the schools potentially. And this would require routes possibly to start as early as 45 minutes earlier than they currently um, are operating. Um, there would also be the potential to need to reverse uh, elementary drop off first and then go to the middle school uh, as opposed to what is currently happening with middle school being dropped off first. And depending on whether or not we have the opportunity to utilize existing routes based on time and capacity, this could mean needing uh, to add additional routes where we would divide those students uh, from the elementary and middle school being combined to try to reduce ride times as an option. So that's the estimated impact as we see it now. Uh, we look forward to further analysis in the future. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Thank you. Our second option that we wanted to discuss is the option of fifth graders remaining at Happy Hollow. Um, this particular option, the reason it is number two and not number one, is the number of students and the type of experience they would have. They would have a shortened middle school experience. Uh, this would be to remain on campus for one year only until we came back and had a conversation about a phase two zoning conversation. The pros, 
you just built four new classrooms uh, at Happy Hollow. So there are four classrooms that are available in terms of space. Uh, there is familiarity for family, families. It does help to address the space concerns at McNair. It does equitably disperse students. The impact of this is an average of about 107 students. The con is that it shortens the middle school experience for our students. It does establish an alternate pattern, one in which we are trying to undo at Owl Creek, we would be recreating on the opposite side of town. And our data has shown us that that might not be the best combination. Instructional materials uh, would be something we would need to purchase in this particular scenario that would not be in place. And then additional staffing for Encore classes. Similarly, we have an option for number three, which would be fifth graders remaining at Butterfield Trail uh, for one year only until phase two rezoning could commence. The deficiency in, in this plan in terms of cons for us is uh, there's limited space at Butterfield. Uh, Butterfield is a, 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 a school that doesn't have four new classrooms available. The pros, of course, are familiarity, the space at McNair, and the impact would be about 97 students. And the impact of the con here would be that if we did bring fifth graders or allow fifth graders to remain on campus for one year, we would need to then be very cognizant of the number of kindergarten students that we put allow into the building, which would be a deficiency potentially that could follow for the next four years as that kindergarten group grows through. You would have then a very small class potentially that would be going through the school. Uh, again, establishing an alternate plan as we talked about with Happy Hollow, the one year transition, instructional materials and additional <coughs> staffing. So our summary is that we would like to create a long-term master plan with a very clear plan so it's not a surprise when we are about to have zoning conversations or uh, changes. Uh, we wanna create and conduct this process in a really organized way that doesn't feel rushed. It gives everybody an opportunity to have some input and some voice. We want to identify those future building needs, including junior high spaces, because guess what? We may have middle school space, but these students are going to grow. They're going to get older, and they're going to need a place to, to be housed. The cost associated with those timelines to address whatever the funding needs are. And then we really think a third party could help us lead through this process. So because you've heard a lot of factors, you've heard from Bob, you've heard from Micah, you've heard from uh, Ms. Hayward and, and Mr. Flickinger, we are proposing that we come back potentially with a special board meeting for action on one of the proposed plans for January 10th, give you some time to think about the conversation and if this is a direction that we need to go. We do have some concerns about the portables that are in place at McNair and that those will be expiring soon and we will need a game plan for how we're going to house students. So we do encourage you to think about which one of those options would be best. We can open the floor for questions as, <coughs> as we can just be organized a little bit. I'm gonna do my best to make sure that Micah and that Bob can hear. So if you have any questions or if you'd like me to go back to a slide, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Yes, uh, for um, Southeast Fayetteville? Yes, ma'am. Bob, you wanna talk about the area that you've identified? Ms. Pomeroy has a question about the location. Yes, I can give you some um, roads to help, you know, kind of zoom in and, and illustrate where the, those uh, boundaries are following. It is primarily following Huntsville Road. So that main artery, that main road is Huntsville Road that is the, the kind of the artery of that purple area that's outlined in red that would be the main road of travel and it's those subdivisions that are on the north side and on the south side of Huntsville Road. Bob, were you able to hear the question? She was asking no, yeah. if that if that only affects the the area that you've talked about it identifies 113 middle school students, correct? Correct. But yeah, Dr. Duncan, I'll need you to repeat the question. Yes, sir, I will. I'm going to do a better okay. job now. I understand the the assignment. 
Got it. So, so right now, the, fur, the, the kids that live the furthest out that are zoned for McNair are going seven miles, correct? And then you estimated that would change to 10 miles if they were to go to John L. Colbert. Is that the kids that live the furthest out from John L. Colbert? Or is that? Yes. So the question average. was the average, Micah, on the analysis that you did for students to be transported be, via vehicle. Um, so not um, stops and not bus routes. Um, yes. the, average, the average miles out, 10 miles out away from school based on student addresses that you received from Mr. Templeton. Is that the kids that live the furthest out from Yes. So that, that is the average of those that are in, in the closer proximities to those that currently reside the furthest out based on based on current student residences. I mean, I think my concern is it's not that it's four more miles, it's 45 minutes earlier in the morning. That's and then the afternoon. That's a lot. Yes. Yes, and, and what this chart shares with you is the run length time of those, those bus routes. That's the other reason we would really prefer to be able to switch the start times so that there is a cushion. And then in some situations, you have multi-sibling households where I'm dropping off little brother or little sister here or, um, it, you know, whatever that looks like. And then we will need to probably have some kind of coordination for if older siblings can be dropped off and then transported from another school, which we do right now, obviously. But we would need to work out what routes would do that on a secondary basis once we know who needs a ride, where are you coming in from, could your parent bring you into Happy Hollow, could we pick you up from Happy Hollow, is there a sibling there? you know, does that, that work for every family? Yes, none of the options, I should have started with that. One, two, and three, none of them are, are wonderful. At the same time, drop off and pick up at an overcrowded school is not short either. Right. Correct. Yes, McNair is a great example of that. You know, sitting on the road, I believe Ms. Hayward pointed that out in a meeting, sitting, sitting on the road waiting for drop off or driving and transporting too. Yes. We have some traffic opportunities all over the city. So I want to make sure I understand this this table. Um, this is current bus route lengths, right? And yes. What is that last column that says length? So, over so for route JJ, what it does, and it's the only route that has to do this because they are traveling further distances. It has two pickups in the afternoon. It's the only bus bus that has two pickups. So the first group, it does pick up at the middle school, then the elementary, one group of students, and then it circles back to Happy Hollow for a second group. Um, and that that portion of the route length route of number two is 68 minutes. But these are current ride times in the morning and the afternoon for the four routes in this area. Um, just the student ride time. It's not including deadhead miles. We've also talked about getting creative with transportation options once we know what is selected and how we do that. We didn't spend a lot of time doing data on option two and three because the, the data would be what it is today right now. Um, so one of the things we would need to know is if, if option one is an option and we wanna move toward that direction, we would then work with Micah to then further refine and determine what does that need to look like? Is it additional routes? Um, is it stops? Is it drop off locations for parents to pick up for buses to be able to pick up and having, you know, trying to figure out what that next step would be. And that is the other reason we're hoping for a special board meeting in January so that we can come back and know that answer so that we can appropriately plan. A point of clarification on the bus transportation impacts. Um, so on slide 20, we're talking about beginning routes 45 minutes earlier. Um, we're also talking about starting school 15 minutes earlier. So does later. that mean that the route would be Oh, later. later. Right. Middle yes. school. Currently, currently these are backward um, to go, not to go back too far, but currently the middle school starts at 745 and elementaries begin at eight. And what we're asking if those could maybe be transitioned to allow for additional travel time. Or if I am a parent, 
I have dropped off my youngest child first as a mom. I'm just talking as a mama. I've dropped my youngest child off first and I'm dropping off my older child second. Yeah. And so if the route begins 45 minutes earlier, elementary (laughs) school, elementary school starts 15 minutes earlier. um, Does that mean that the impact to the, the, average impact to the bus route is an additional 30 minutes? Potentially, yes. Um, So the table that I was showing you that Micah put together for us, uh, this is the current route length summary table based off of the current routes that interact with this neighborhood currently or these neighborhoods along this pass. But but the routes would change if they were going to a different place. Correct. So is that... Makes yeah, sense. I'm trying to understand what the impact of that change would be in terms of bus. Right. So that's correct. So so what I this table is asking. capturing. Ms. McClure, yeah, come up. Go ahead, Micah. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, so what what this this table is capturing, obviously, is the current ride time. And as, as we mentioned in the other slide, we know that we must now travel a further distance. In order to be able to travel a further distance, you do have to, to add to the, the estimated route time as well as the anticipated traffic. So that estimation of 45 minutes is to leave the transportation facility uh, to then go and pick up students as they are currently routed in terms of both McNair and Happy Hollow students at this time being routed together. Um, that is, is part of what we're trying to account for. So this is an estimation that we're traveling a further distance to another campus um, that would require us to build in that time. And we're also trying to adhere to still dropping students early enough, not, not right at the bell time. Um, so we're also trying to account for what times we're currently dropping off students based on what we're seeing uh, in current practice. Uh, just for a, uh, some context, uh, the biggest reason that would help us to swap the start times, uh, basically in this area, you would be talking about if we don't switch the start times, you would pick up uh, elementary and middle, stu- middle school students together. Uh, you would drive almost right by Happy Hollow, go to John L. Colbert Middle, drop those middle school students off, and then come all the way back to Happy Hollow to drop those students. Whereas if we switch the times, you are looking at uh, earlier pickups, but maybe not quite as much as you might think, Mm -hmm. but it would require us to be able to drop off earlier at Happy Hollow. So we may uh, have to be allowed to drop off as early as 7 a.m. for a 7.45 start time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it would make more sense to go ahead and drop those students from way out east at Happy Hollow, then proceed on to John L. Colbert, drop the middle school students, then keeping in mind that same bus and route does secondary or junior high and high school pretty much in the same area that they began. And if we didn't switch them, we would have elementary kids riding the bus all the way to Owl Creek area and then all to John L. Colbert and and then then all all the way way back back across town. There, There are some schools where you drop kids off an hour before start time already, right? No. No. How far? 30? Yes. 30 minutes. Our drop-off windows now for middle schools uh, early as as early as 7:10 a.m. for a 7:45 start. Okay. Uh, at the elementaries, it's 7:20 for an 8 o'clock start. So about 40 minutes. Yeah, and that I mean, just anecdotally, I watch buses drop kids at Washington when I'm dropping Gus at the Owl Creek bus there, and that's like 7:10, like that's 7:15. That's like 45 that, that's minutes before school. So, like, that's and that, that's not a problem. I'm just saying that, like, yes, that is currently happening. Elementary, our, our drop-off window is begins at 7.15, 7.15 at elementary yes. schools. So are we talking about switching end of the flipping end of the day time, school end times as well? Yes. So how does that affect transportation? We would, we would start. We would leave our lot, start at John L. Now, Colbert Middle, mm-hmm. pick up. Those students come back, pick up Happy they're Hollow, just waiting, and I take see. them. Okay, yeah. so they're waiting at school a little bit longer at the end of the day. But they but they get out later, so the, see how no, they would get out earlier. The elementary, elementary would get out elementary. earlier. Get out earlier. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're you're correct. We would start elementary, 
then have to go pick up middle, then come back. I think. Would we? Would at the end of the day, we're picking up elementary, like Happy Hollow, going over to John L. Or are we leaving elementary there? And it's so. Does I that think, make sense? What I'm asking. Yeah, I think. No. Are they waiting there longer? Are the elementary school kids waiting there longer? Are they on the? No, we would have to do one or the other. They, yeah, they. I'm just thinking in the morning it would not be such a long ride. In the afternoon, yeah. the ride time will be about the same. But yes, they would be picked up at Happy Hollow, go to Colbert, come back to go home. But that would not require them boarding a bus at 5.50 yeah. p.m. And is it, is, it seems to me like you don't really start mapping out your bus routes for the school year until you have that enrollment data to uh, pretty. We make adjustments after we, we do student counts and kind of get an idea, but our routes are pretty static. They've stayed pretty much the same. So oh, this have. would be okay. new, obviously, for us. Um, but once we did kind of figure out if there are some overcrowding issues throughout any school year, we make adjustments based on the, the ridership on certain routes. We do have some data. We have two schools already on Rupal, so we have some data that mm -hmm. tells us kind of how does this flow, how does it work, but we have not dropped anyone off yet at Colbert Middle School, and we will need to go through that practice, practice and exercise to then tighten. Our goal is always to try to squeeze on that time to get better and better and better and better um, as, as safe as we can um, <laughs> as quickly. So then I, I guess that 45 minutes earlier number, that's looking at the current routes and then taking on the additional um, students that would be zoned for John L. Colbert would add roughly 45 minutes to that route. And that is not adjusted for the start time change that we're talking about. Correct. From our standpoint, the 45 minutes is to account for keeping the middle school first and having to travel back and forth through heavier traffic for that scenario. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McClure, when we talk about um, route time, are we ta we're talking, that's not student ride time, right? If, if you're first, potentially, but we try to factor in, I've left my house as a driver. I have now done my pre-trip bus check, I've inspected my bus, I've gotten on my bus, and now I'm driving out to pick up my, my furthest point, and then I'm going to pick up children along the way. But it's all encompassed as part I, of the route. I guess so I just mean, like, question. if we if we have our, like, we keep our buses by Ramey. So, right, so a chunk, like, when we're talking about a 45-minute route for kids at, for, for these kids, they, that furthest point out is really far from Ramey. So Correct. there is some chunk of that time that is a driver alone on a bus, not the first. On the bus. Right. So I, I just just for families who are like, is my child spending an hour on the bus? Like, I, I the, there is a chunk of time there that is not your child on a bus. It's a driver on a bus getting from Ramey to the farthest point out in the Happy Hollow Zone, and then picking up the first child and then driving, just for what that's worth. the numbers of the 113 students like I guess I'm just wondering do we have to extend that all the way out to Elkins like no, how could we capture do we have any different yeah. rezoning or yeah. zone that we could look at yes I think any any scenario that we would like to look at in terms of the circle and the color and how we do that absolutely yes so that maybe we don't have to start mm -hmm. so early I mean we would probably still recommend that start time be switched. I think that. that not that. I just oh, I'm sorry. Bus ride time. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But I, mm, so the 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 places where it talks about the furthest distance. So like if we look at that, I always love teeth when we talk about zoning. If we look at that far purple tooth. Yes. Like the long um, rectangle. I'm looking at the tooth. Yes. Got it. Um, that, I mean, that, that tooth is also the farthest point from McNair. So, Bob, right. we're talking about the lower right-hand screen. Um, it's a tooth. 
It doesn't have that's to be a two. 20, Whatever you want it to 20. be. Located over here. Uh, that's about 20 intermediate students. Or middle, middle school students. Okay, so 20, 20 students. So we have 20 kids there, and it takes them... Like, what do we know what their bus route is to McNair? That's what I mean. But it, so, so that if we were going to make that happy hollow to JLC zone smaller, almost certainly we would take off the part that's the furthest from JLC. Yeah, the furthest is, but, is the JJ route uh, that Micah mentioned. Uh, and right now to McNair, it's, it's not an ex exceptionally long amount of time. Uh, a lot of it is the deadhead time driving out to that point. Okay. But we do cul-de-sac out there called Stokenberry, mm -hmm. which only about five houses in that cul-de-sac are our. Every other house in that neighborhood is Elkins School District. And we have in the past had students in there, so we basically pick them up in Elkins District and then come back. But uh, that would be the furthest east. So... For those kids on that in that Stokenberry situation, there, I don't I don't know if we if it's possible to subtract the deadhead time, but like their experienced drive time, route bus route time, from Stokenberry to McNair is, I would say approximately five to fifty minutes. Uh, okay. the, where you would look at adding time is if you do pick up students in that area, go all the way to Colbert Middle, drop middle school kids, then come back to Happy Hollow. Now you are looking at those students being on the bus for over an hour. But, an if, hour we, but if, we, if we didn't put those kids on the bus in the morning to go out to jail, if we didn't put elementary kids on the bus for that out and back, how long are those kids in the that Stokenberry Circle area on the bus to get to JLC compared to how long are they on the bus to get to McNair? Do we do we know that? It'd be an additional probably fifteen to twenty minutes to get to JLC than to get to McNair. Okay. And Stokenberry is a is one of those anomalies because it is a split district neighborhood, mm -hmm. and we have students that opt to. Uh, they may be on this side of the road and be with Elkins School District and might choose to be a school transfer into Fayetteville, which we might not know today right now, and the same might also be true. Back and forth. Right. When, when we, in that mileage that we were talking about, um, three to seven miles to McNair, six to ten to John L. Colbert, is that ten miles and that seven miles from that Stokenberry neighborhood, the furthest out. Is that that 10 miles that we were talking about? So for what we were provided in terms of where students, that's that's more so the Van Hoos area uh, as, as the student uh, data points were provided. So again, those are average distances. Um, and that is, again, accounting for a direct student residence around the Van Hoos area directly to either McNair or Colbert. Um, so again, we wanted to provide a kind of a representative average um, but for students that reside a little bit further uh, than that, that distance would be you know, a few miles further, depending on if you have students that are residing in that area. Okay, if the cutoff is Van Hoos and there's a loop there uh, south of Huntsville, Mally Wagnon, Van Hoos, uh, if the cutoff is that is the furthest east point, that would obviously reduce times because you're talking about going another four to five miles into Elkins where we also have students in our boundary. Uh, if they were to stay at McNair, that would reduce times for everyone. But it would also reduce the number of uh, slots we're freeing up in one building compared to another. Correct. Yes. Correct. Well, and, and of course, all this is just a snapshot in time today. Uh, we have no guarantee yes. that everyone stays stays put. Yes. Uh, and, and I appreciate you pointing out the, the Elkins Fayetteville issue where you have people who whatever reason transfer in or out um, and we don't know that you know, and I've, I've been on both sides years. of that conversation so it's interesting to be um, on one side versus you know how I felt very strongly one well, way. Either way right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was wrong on both instances right. yes exactly uh, but but changes in address changes in movement how I access school if it's okay for me to ride the bus if it's not okay for, all of those parameters and 
differences are going to change just like fingerprints. It, it, it really is you're chasing this conversation. Um, and that is the other reason that we've, we really want you to think about a phase one approach and then coming back for phase two. Phase two, at least we would have hard data of who physically walked through the door at Colbert Middle School to say, ah, the population is not our guesstimate, it is actually X. And then we could make some decisions based off of, of that conversation. So I, I agree it's hard to, uh, to be anticipating what the behavior is going to be in a building that has not yet been finished or had the ribbon cut to open. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, and, sir. And thinking through this, I think about you, you put yourself in, in it's like if this were my family, how would this affect my family? And I have one in middle school and one in junior high, one in the high school. Um, and we were looking at that, that John L. Colbert, or that um, Ramey Junior High, which is Happy Hollow is zoned for, is only two miles from John L. Colbert. Correct. So, yes. Hmm. That's close. Very close, yes. And it's gonna be a beautiful school. Uh, that's the other part is we get to do something that a lot of people don't get to do, which is open a state-of-the-art facility uh, for students that um, no other student in our, our district will, will have access to. And so this is a good problem to have. Um, it, is, it is painful as we have the conversations because, you know, the answer is no one wants to move and everybody's happy exactly where they are. Um, but it is, a, it, it is progress. We are growing and it it is smart for us to have the conversation. Well, and I think, just eating my sonic pretzel. I'm glad. <clears throat> You're welcome. Um, everybody isn't happy where they are, right? Like McNair is not happy where it is. So people are happy going to McNair, but they need someone else to not go to McNair in order for themselves to stay happy going to McNair. And I think that that's, I think that's a really, really important thing to yes. acknowledge. Like it's, a wonderful community and I totally understand like great job Mc team McNair um, I believe our inbox but also would like agree we, ju with we you. just we just don't fit <laughs> yes yes so. any other questions for Bob or for Micah we looked at the demographic numbers back four or five months ago I, w I would assume for Bob that those pretty much have held I mean those projections we that was a great amount of detail and um, I, I would assume that variation hasn't changed very much based on re slightly revised numbers. Bob, on the demographic numbers, have you seen those hold since our initial conversation? Definitely. You know, McNair didn't change much. I mean, it, it definitely is still overcrowded and it's still full. So the challenges for McNair did not ease up at all with this new school year starting or this school year starting. Um, and yeah, the challenge is purely a location of facilities problem. And it's not enough on the eastern half of the district. So we're, we're having to really try to push the kids to where the facilities are. And that's what's creating this real challenge. But no, the numbers came in in line and it, it's it's not easing up with this, this year's data. He's not. And I was using a term, I was using a term of art for Bob that I was probably using it incorrectly. Right. Uh, I meant the subgroups, the, um, all the various different subgroups that we were yeah. looking at, uh, those those numbers. The the subgroup numbers. Did uh, you see those remain consistent when you reviewed those? Socioeconomic. The uh, free and reduced lunch. And the, yes. The, those numbers. Yes. They they didn't change. Yeah, I recall. Percentage wise, they didn't change. Thank you. I recall something Bob said before when we were looking at every time we moved a pocket here, there, elsewhere, it really didn't make a huge difference. No one way or the other in terms of the representation of uh, you know, socioeconomics and other uh, subgroups. Yes. So it's, it's nice to know that we're not sitting in a situation where, uh-oh, you know, one neighborhood or one change is going to drastically alter any particular building. True. Same thing with when you think about the funding that flows yes. into buildings based on the population. Very true. You're, so you're, you're wanting a, um, this to be a um, uh, temporary change an adjustment based on what you presented here, there may be some interest in perhaps keeping that one tooth, if you will, the farthest uh, corner of the district in McNair. With or without the tooth, yes, sir. Um, and then 
spend a little more time with our transportation and other uh, experts to help uh, look at a, a bigger shift. And in, I, I think Micah's work with Transfar has been very helpful for us in terms of insight and planning. And so we think that that would be a good addition to our phase two conversation. Um, it was something we heard a lot and we read a lot in surveys about transportation time and, and those things which, you know, our, our, our children aren't necessarily as, as mindful of what those things are, but as, you know, the mom that gets up that makes the cereal, I'm very aware of, of what that means. So um, I think that would be our, our preference is to look at something in phase two that would be a larger process and maybe encompass the planning of additional buildings, locations, site locations, and, and getting um, a more, a, a bigger plan. And then second, to come back and be able to have some type of special board meeting at the beginning of January to talk about our of one, two, and three, of which you don't like any noted. Um, could we do one, two, or three to get a game plan since we are not not going to be able to have portables at McNair and McNair is past capacity uh, to have a solution to get to the larger conversation of phase two. Well said. And I, uh, Dr. Colbert and Dr. Duncan and I have talked about she, she mentioned a, a third party coming in um, to help us partially just to assess every building in our district to figure out how many seats we actually have, whether or not we need additional seats and what kind of additional seats we need overall, um, and then kind of where those, those seats, where and when. So obviously, I mean, we're looking at a seven-year uh, window before we need to have additional capacity at the junior high level, which is not very much time considering it takes three years to build a school. So I think phase two would have to, and I think you said this in your comment just then, would have to take into account um, that additional building as well, even though you know it would be theoretical at that time. I think it would be helpful for us to know, uh, to have a plan for, well, we, we are going to have to plan for a junior high, you know, in seven years. And the kids we would like to go to that school will come from this area instead of just saying we're going to build a school and figure out who goes there, which um, uh, is not ideal. So I, I would, that's what I, how I envision phase two. But I do think considering the fact that we start enrollment to schools in January, right, Dr. Yeah. Colbert? Um, and because we set out in the beginning to try to give parents as much of a, you know, as much time as possible to plan for the approaching school year to know where their kids will be going to school. Originally, we had, we had targeted to give them one year um, to plan for that, and we just did never have a good option. Um, not that we have a great option now, but we have something that I think is you know, I think the idea of, of doing a, a phased phased process makes a whole lot more sense than what we were trying to do over the summer. So I think that's the, the urgency in trying to get a decision made in January with regard to phase one. Uh, but I do appreciate the idea of having a meeting in January to, to revisit this so that parents can give us their feedback and thoughts and we can hear from folks. Um, so I, I feel better about that than trying to make this decision in two days. So, great. Thoughts from any other I have a, questions? maybe just a general question for <laughs> Micah and Transpar. Um, you know, this is the first time we've engaged with you all to my memory, and I'm just curious um, about, I guess, your, if you could tell us more about your services, especially as we're thinking about phase two and, um, you know, is it possible to project transportation times when you're looking at, at future school, you know, uh, siting decisions and um, just wondering if you could talk through the various scenarios where, um, where your analysis comes into play. Absolutely. 
So we we engage in this work with districts of all sizes across the nation. And oftentimes what we're tasked with is not just looking at current facilities and locations and, and what the impact would be of just shifting boundary lines, but rather what would a future state scenario look like for campuses that have not yet been built um, and, and really needing to understand uh, to the point earlier if we make a decision now to have this group of students attend this future new school, um, what does that impact look like? And so it, it does require a partnership uh, with your demographer. And in this case, Mr. Templeton, we would be working closely with him, one, to understand what are the enrollment projections out to the year in which we anticipate the new school to be able to be open. Um, and then what are we looking at in terms of the breakdown of students per grade level uh, to then determine, are we also talking about potentially shifting grade configurations at schools, or are we talking about operating in a very similar state at the various grade levels? Um, and then be, being able to pair that with a, a transportation routing plan. Um, that requires us to look at, at bell times uh, for, for that anticipated year of bringing on that new school to determine if there's enough time between tiers to transport the students who would, are currently being uh, are attending a, a certain school, but in this estimated year would be attending a different school. Um, would there be enough time to travel from those student residences in that particular area, um, similar to what we're talking about now with McNair to, to Colbert? Um, to still travel within the same time frame that Bell schedules would allow? Um, are we talking about a, such significant growth in that particular year uh, where the we know that currently there are five buses operating in that area, but based on demographic projections, now we are anticipating seven school buses needing to operate in that area. So the analysis has to be paired and overlaid with, one, your demographic projections, uh, two, how many current routes does it take to, to currently operate the system? And then three, what would the estimated impact if we can identify pretty closely the location of this new school? And that'll be important uh, to have conversations with you. Do we have a site to where we can get pretty close to the, the estimated pinpoint X, Y coordinates of that location so that we can model in the routing software what it would look like to shift the current routes to now being able to drop and pick up at that new school location. Uh, so it does take a, a much deeper dive when we're talking about really looking at the routing structure of moving students from one school to another. Um, but we, we take that both with, with the projections for enrollment, the current routing structure. And then one of the things I, I do want to be candid about is that it may require larger conversations around, do we need to shift bell times in, in order to create a more efficient routing network? Do we need to look at shifting from a two tier to a potentially three tier or four tier system? Uh, I'm currently in Indiana uh, today and we just worked with a school district, Tippecanoe School Corporation, in which in order to achieve some changes they were making, they transitioned from a two tier to a four tier system. Uh, but you have to have the, the willingness to be able to make those changes and the time to be able to make those changes. But it did. It allowed them to reduce the total number of routes that they were running um, as they're experiencing growth. Um, so there are several pieces to this conversation. Uh, but this is work that we we engage in, again, with districts of all sizes. Um, we work with you to establish what your constraints and parameters would be um, for this new school, who we expect to attend uh, that school. And then we take the data that, that we have to really start to model and redesign uh, a, a similar to your current state routing network, but also maybe recommended changes that would potentially enhance the efficiency uh, for routing in, in that year and in that specific scenario. Thank you, Micah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, other questions for Bob or Micah before they log off of the Zoom? Uh, and so the outputs of that analysis would be like number of routes, route times. Um, um, I heard you say both of those. Would it also be things like cost, transportation, cost, the, uh, you know, yeah. estimates of um, thinking about thinking about being able to incorporate transportation cost projections into our facilities siting decisions, both for the district and for families, um, is is sort of the the thrust of the question. Um, and, and maybe even vehicle miles traveled as well in the future. 
Absolutely. So we would request preliminary data that gives us your current state information on what are you what are you currently uh, what are your current expenditures for transportation? How many buses does it currently take the take to operate the system? And then as we go through financial modeling as well as uh, route redesign modeling, we would we would want to to include in the output. Uh, how many buses are we estimating? How many tiers would we be estimating? Is it Are we going to operate in a similar structure with combined middle school and elementary, or are we talking about potentially decoupling some of those combined routes? So now what is the new estimated number of buses based on your average cost per, per route annually? Can we then say if you, it currently takes you, just for the sake of the conversation, a round number of 100 buses, uh, but if we make these recommended changes, we're estimating now that that would be 85 buses required to operate the system. What is the cost of the reduction or the estimated savings, rather, of those 15 buses based on what we estimate your annual cost per bus to be? And we know that that's important because uh, having worked directly for school districts for many years, making those changes should, in theory, allow you to free that funding to do whatever it is that you need to do at the campus level. And if we're talking about needing to make changes to the infrastructure or whatever it may be on campuses, we hope that that estimated savings from transportation uh, can offset the cost of, of some of the other expenditures that will be required to make those changes. Um, so we would do the financial analysis uh, as well as the transportation analysis to provide those metrics. Um, if we can collect the odometer readings from your current buses uh, from start to end of a single year, we can also model any anticipated reductions in mileage based on uh, maybe the, the buses not having to travel as far based on the schools that they would be serving during that school year. Um, so as long as we have the data available to us uh, based on your current state, we, we could absolutely extrapolate that and model it out over time uh, to provide those those outputs. Thank you. Yes, sir. I would like to see the map with the furthest east maybe taken off. Or okay, the two. Yeah, okay. just to kind of see numbers. And I know we've probably seen that before. It was probably one of our options back in the summer. Okay. Bob, I don't know if you could hear Tracy. She was asking if it would be possible that the purple tooth that I'm pointing to can we also, uh, when we come back and have our next conversation in January, could we have that purple tooth taken off and added sure, back to we, McNair? Yeah, we, we can change it however, however directed to change it. Okay. So that's, that's the, like, easily done. That makes an impact. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah. or to how far east that makes an impact. And, mm -hmm. and I'll make sure that, that we follow up with you and Micah, that Mike and I follow up with you and Micah, um, after the meeting to, to make sure we're all on the same page and then let you look at that. What's interesting is that next break, if you move west to kind of that next clump of, of homes, that area, yeah, right, right. Okay, that's about 20. And then that general area there, if you'll just kind of circle your, your cursor around that general, a little bigger, where those neighborhoods are. That one, two, three, four, five kind of neighborhood Go left, left, right there and up that those, you know, the whole group of neighborhoods in that, make a bigger circle. That's <laughs> about 30 kids. That's about 30. Sorry, Bob. That That's about 30. If you go over to the west, that, well, further, yeah. wish I could. To the break, like kind of. Past well, it. I think he's talking about those little cluster where you yeah. can see the. Yeah, that's yes. oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm yes, that area tooth. right there. We're that not area. in the tooth anymore. The darker, Got it. Yeah. It's not in the tooth. That's about 30. Okay. okay. So we'll bring you some, some data back. Tooth, no tooth. No tooth. Okay. But other options, though, because we really need to talk about doing at least 100 some students. It's going to make a difference at McNair if yeah. we do that. So just keep that in mind, please. Yeah. Even 100 students, though. Right. Under capacity, yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Okay, any other questions for Micah or for Bob before they log off on their end? Could could we see the change in free and reduced for lunch percentage to on yes. whatever the scenarios we look at? Yes, Bob, can we also add subgroups back in for discussion? Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. that's all we have, Ms. Weitzman. 
All right, well, we are not taking any action on this today, so um, we will have the chance to discuss it. I guess it's not even on our agenda. It's on there, on Thursday. Thursday. Okay, we're yeah. going to discuss it um, in December and take action. And uh, schedule January. a special meeting. Well, and, well. and we'll try to, so I guess our goal for Thursday is to schedule a meeting for yes. January. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, in terms of the parents who have come here today, uh, we don't have public comment at our workshops, which I know you guys already know that, but I just wanted to mention. But we do have that um, opportunity at our, our board meeting on Thursday. Um, we, can't, we can't respond to any comments that you all have, but it's obviously an opportunity for you to share any thoughts or feedback you have, or, or you can also email us or whatever um, on Thursday during the during the regular board meeting and will, will this information be up on the website in the normal spot okay, okay. and will we be discussing options two and three also or yeah we aren't we gonna to yeah we can we can talk about that if, on thursday if we at that time say you know we we can go ahead and take a couple of options off the table we can take that action on thursday but we're not going to take that action here today right um does that answer your question? And for folks that want a public comment, they need to register 24 hours in advance. Yeah, yeah there's a link on our website in order to do that. So. All right. Happy to email and phone call as well. Yeah. Good, good or talk now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think there's also, um, if you have questions about house, like a lot of, a lot of my conversations with families have run into like complex details of school funding. Like, well, what if we add it or, or like how schools work internally? Like what if we added a bunch of classrooms onto McNair or what if we built uh, another school in, on the east side of town? Um, and, and how like the state determines adequacy funding, how many chairs at a certain, like if, if, we, if we have this number of middle grade chairs, how many more they're willing to help us with, how much money Fayetteville is willing to give us in a millage to build another school, how long a millage process takes, and then the construction of the school process. So there, I think it's a lot of times families are like, I have an idea. Have you thought about? Um, and, and I think that, like, yeah, yes, we've, we, we have thought about it. That doesn't mean that you don't have other great ideas that we want to hear about or that you don't deserve an explanation of why different ideas aren't feasible to solve the problem for 2023 um, and, and what, we, what it would take to have that solution be a good one for 2026 or 2027, right? So, so having all of those conversations with us, like get after it, do it. We want you to understand. We're here to help you understand. Admin is here to help you understand. Um, and, and, and we want to understand from you. It, the zoning conversation is just one that can really grow like a lot of arms and legs. Um, like we, you watch us talk about lines and you're like, but what if maybe we could create a magnet school at Holt that just did that, right? And, and like those are, that's part of why that like zone to, or, uh, phase two zoning conversation is there and why, why there's just like a lot of conversation necessary and we're, we're not ignoring you. We're not like just thinking about lines like idiots. Like we were like, I'm always There's a lot. Like an idiot, I know. I mean, Tim. Tim is the exception. Don't call Tim. I'm um, just kidding. <laughs> um, but but like, we, we want to have those conversations. The fact that those that we don't like the, the feasibility of explaining how all of that school funding works in a meeting like this is like not feasible. But it doesn't mean that it's not feasible in a in a phone conversation. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But it, I, I I understand how your brain is creative, and we appreciate that. Um. I think it's also just one final note on, on this conversation is, just as a reminder, when we had this conversation or when we had this discussion as a board over the summer, we did a very um, thorough, um, we, we invested a lot of time and energy in trying to get feedback from the community with regard to all sorts of concepts and ideas. It was, you know, all, a lot of considerations were on the table. And at that point, I think we had 700, is that right? Mm -hmm. 700 um, comments on our, uh, through the portal. So 
and I personally read every single one of them. I don't know about <laughs> the rest of the board, but uh, but I summarized I summarized a lot of those for the for the board. Um, so I feel like we have a very I feel like we have a very good understanding of the overall broad concerns and priorities of our of our district. I think we did a very very good job of of trying to assess that. And so I don't think we're having a different conversation. I think we're having an ongoing conversation about trying to do what's best for McNair. So I just wanted to say that um, with regard to any concerns that we're just, you know, trying to spring something on people. We This has been a work in progress. It's, it's a continuing um, effort to try to ease the crowding uh, situation at McNair, so. I think, I think the, the other thing that I would say is that um, one, one thing that's great about the members of the board um, is that we don't just think about our own experience, right? At like our, our personal walk with our own children, but we do walk with our own children. Um, and we do like, we are your neighbors. We are unpaid. We drive, we, we have to drive east west in this town just like you do. We like zig and zag to um, like gymnastics and soccer and um, church and like we're, we're living what, what you're living. So, um, we, that doesn't mean that we've had your experience. Um, we, we all live in different parts of town, but like we're, we're not making decisions that don't affect our own children and our own neighbors and our own like nephews and nieces. Like we were like, we're in it with you. And if we had a perfect, if we had a solution, that would mean that nobody ever had to use Denise West Carter again. Like we would have given it to you. Like <laughs> you would have told it to us and we would have given it to you like a hundred years. Like, like it, there's just, that's, we're like, in, we're, we're also not the only ones that make decisions, right? Like the city zones and the planning commission plans. And a um, hundred years ago, people built highways that go like the, you know, like we're, we're working with what we have. So just that too. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, I will call this. Oh, do you have anything, Dr. No, we're good. Okay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat>